I'm Ian Mills, and today I'm talking to you about text New Testament textual criticism. The most famous line from William Shakespeare's Hamlet is, to be or not to be, that is the question. Or is it? We don't have William Shakespeare's journals. We don't have his notebooks. We don't have the autograph. What we do have are a number of editions. And indeed, ah, there it is. The second quarto and the first folio, two of our three earliest editions, both read, to be or not to be, that is the question, our familiar line. You'll notice the earlier text is called the second quarto, because there's a first quarto, which is the earliest text of Shakespeare's Hamlet. And this says, less memorably, to be or not to be, I, there's the point. <laughs> what did Hamlet say? What did Billy Shakes write down? Another English luminary. What is Voldemort looking for in the first book of the Harry Potter series? You're all cheating. Uh, <laughs> you're Americans, most of you, uh, which means you grew up reading that he was searching for the Sorcerer's Stone. But as the, the more enlightened among you know, the English edition, the first edition, was printed with the Philosopher's Stone, because the Philosopher's Stone is actually a thing, right? Um, it is uh, an alchemic tradition that first shows up in the fourth century, a Greek author, and then has an afterlife in Byzantine and medieval legends. But the Sorcerer's Stone in America. Now, there are two interesting questions. Well, there's, a, there's, there's at least more than one interesting question we can ask about these textual variants. You may be interested in knowing what was first. What did the author write down? And in these cases, that's probably not too hard to figure out, right? We know J.K. Rowling first wrote down the Philosopher's Stone, and that's an interesting question, because by that we learn things about her, right? We know that she knows some things about medieval and Byzantine history and mythology. Interesting to know. That's not the only interesting question you could ask. You might also wonder, where did these come about? How, did, how, how do we get, I, there's the point, as the conclusion of Hamlet's most favorite line? Um, was this a copyist? Was this an actor's script? And by learning that, we might learn something about how the first audience members read this. Um, in the case of Harry Potter, you would learn that American students don't learn about medieval history as well as British students. And so editors thought it would be necessary to call, retitle it The Sorcerer's Stone. So kids didn't think this was about metaphysics, but knew it, in fact, was about magic, right? And as a matter of fact, it's not entirely clear that I, there's the point, wasn't the earlier version. Uh, there is a debate in Shakespeare scholarship, and it is just possible that the first quarto was a initial draft, was something that Shakespeare first wrote down that was later revised. So, Good news. None of you are Shakespeare scholars or Potterheads, both noble professions. You're all divinity students. And in 1927, the angel, an angel came down and pointed out where ho the Holy Script was hidden, and we have the original King James Bible, right? <laughs> now, it's remotely possible I've confused Mormonism with Methodism. <laughs> um, no, in fact, we don't have Jesus' notebooks. We don't have an angel pointing out where the original King James Bible came from. What we have are a bunch of manuscripts. And I am going to do my best to walk you through these today. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to hit every witness to the New Testament. I'm not going to be able to go through every sigla in the bottom um, of your apparatus. This little insert is going to be your lifeline. This is where you start going to, to figure out what these manuscripts are. We can talk more about that in a bit. What I will try to do is sort of introduce this to you. So let's start with some Bible verses. Flip in your Bibles to Matthew 27, 49, and you find 
that Jesus is hanging on the cross, not yet dead. And one of the soldiers grabs a spear, stabs him, blood and water flows out, and he perishes on the cross. Right? We all remember from our Bible study growing up that, Matthew, that, in, Je that in Matthew, Jesus is stabbed to death on the cross. I don't. This is in two of our best, most reliable manuscripts of the New Testament. Two of our oldest, continuous copies of Matthew both have this, Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. And yet, it's not printed in any of our Bibles. What's going on? Similarly, if you flip to Luke 6, you find the story of Jesus and the disciples plucking grain on the Sabbath, and some Pharisees, who are apparently hanging out in fields, uh, call them out on this. Um, and, of course, then there's the classic story afterwards, where Jesus says, On that same day, seeing somebody working on the Sabbath, Jesus said to him, If you know what you are doing, you are blessed. But if you don't know, you are a transgressor of the law. Remember this story? I don't either. These, this is in Codex Beze, Sigma D. One, again, one of our oldest continuous manuscripts of Luke. And yet, printed in no Bible. Fascinating, huh? These are not apocryphal Gospels. These are continuous New Testament texts. These are real Bibles that real people brought to church, real people heard read to them. Um, these are New Testaments, and yet we don't print these. So there are a multitude of questions we could ask about these fascinating stories. But let's start with, why don't either of these end up in your and my New Testament? Look at this glorious mess. <laughs> Obviously the top text, as you all are now abundantly aware, is our critical text of the New Testament, our best attempt at reconstructing the oldest form of the New Testament, and the bottom half is our apparatus. I once heard a PhD candidate at an esteemed institution that will remain unnamed lament the fact that all Greek New Testaments had apparatuses on them. Apparatus. That, I think, reflects a profound naivety about where our New Testament comes from. And I'm hoping to inspire in you some wonder or at least some appreciation for what all this is. And to do that, we have to sort of figure out how to get through all this. So let's begin. Oh, huh. you, if you grew up, like I did in church, you've probably seen some form of this horrible chart. Um, apologetic hogwash, is that how I titled it? Yeah, so this is originally published in Josh McDowell, and it's been republished and republished a million times over. Um, first of all, don't read apologetics. It's bad for your soul. Um, but there are at least three problems with this. First of all, um, this is usually presented as demonstrating the reliability of the New Testament. Does that make any sense? We have the autographs for the, the life of Simon the Stylite. Uh, this, um, can you give me a date for Simeon the Stylite, this century? Uh, yeah, fourth, fourth, fifth. Fourth, fifth century uh, hagiographic, um, or this fourth, fifth century saint who performs miracles. We have the autograph of that. Does that mean that text is 100% historically reliable because we have the original? Because that's as good as text criticism can get, is finding the autograph. No, of course not. That's a separate question, right? Whether or not, yes. What does the word autograph mean? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Adam. Autograph is the copy you write down. So it is the author's initial inscription of the text. Yeah. So the separate question. Second of all, every number in this chart is wrong. <laughs> all of them are wrong. <laughs> um, and Actually, the one that might be right is probably most of the New Testament fits in that timeline, although that's still a misleading number. Um, but, uh, and I think that's not even right. Um, but all the numbers are wrong, and if they were right, or if we were to correct them, the numbers are also deeply, deeply misleading. This is P52, the John Rylance papyrus of the Gospel of John. It's our, probably our oldest fragment of the New, text, New Testament text, and this is all of it. <laughs> 100% of our witness, and if you read McDowell, he says this is written, this was copied some 30 years after John was written, which is, of course, completely un, 
you, you can't, I mean, we don't know that. This was written sometime in the second or third century. That's as good as we get. Um, and our closest, closest comparanda, the closest hand that looks like this, we, we date these based on the handwriting, which is a really, really imprecise science, is another apocryphal gospel. Um, and I don't think McDowell is going to uh, trumpet that, the Egerton papyrus. Um, so there are, in fact, about 5,300 manuscripts of the New Testament written in Greek. That is, handwritten copies of the New Testament. Only 889 of these come from the first thousand years. So already we've cut our number, um, I mean, at least a fifth. We've cut, we've cut the number way, way, way down. But of the, five, of the 889, about I mean, 850 of these, probably a little less than that, um, but 850 of these all agree with each other about 95% of the time and are, according to almost every scholar you will ever meet, basically useless for recovering the initial text of the New Testament. They're what we call the majority or Byzantine text, and they do no, they do us almost no good. Uh, this is a chart I was sent last night by my friend Jacob Peterson, who's publishing on this. Um, this is also, this is a chart of the, of these 889 manuscripts and where they come from, um, date-wise. And honestly, this number right here is too high, <laughs> and Jacob agrees with me on this. Um, this represents the most optimistic dating. This is somewhere between seven and zero, um, and some of these get pushed here, and some of these get pushed here. Um, but at best, what we have is something like this. Most of our 889 manuscripts come from the 10th century, and most are lectionaries. Um, and then we have a smattering of other ones. Uh, oh, I had another chart that was supposed to pop up. Oh, well. Um, the case is much, much well, it's much worse than McDowell would have you think, and it's significantly better than I think Bart Ehrman would have you think if you just read his popular work. Um, there are roughly three variants for every word in the Greek New Testament. There are five endings to the Gospel of Mark, four endings to the Book of Romans, two endings to the Gospel of Luke. There are stories that drop out, that move around. The Frick of Adultera is the famous one. Um, an angel descending at the pool of Bethsaida. There are real and interesting problems, but we need not be, we do, do not abandon hope. Uh, let's, let's build together a shared vocabulary of what these witnesses are. So, scholars are bad at naming things. We're going to go over the Greek manuscripts um, and the basis on which they assign these names, on which they categorize these, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, well, it does, but it's inconsistent. Uh, so first, we have the papyrus. And we call them papyrus because they are written on papyrus, which are reeds that you flatten out, interweave, and then flatten some more, basically. Um, we, we call them papyri because they're written on papyrus. And then we have magiscules, which we call because they're written on magis. No, that's not right. Magiscules are written on parchment, which is animal skin. Uh, so these are our first two classes. We're going to talk about dates in a second. These are our first two classes of manuscripts. Can anyone tell? These are both the same passage from the New Testament. Can anyone tell what this is? Fun. N, R, K, Pain, Ho, Logos, Chi, Ho, Logos, Ain. Right? A little bit harder here. N, arcane, pain, hologos, chi, hologos, right? In the beginning was the word. Papyrus in your apparatus will show up under this sigla, a big capital P with some numbers after it. They're numbered according to the order in which they are cataloged. Um, not quite discovered, but the, the, um, we, we number them according to uh, when we get them cataloged. Um, Majuscules, as a rule, are capital letters. They started off with English letters, and then we moved into capital Greek letters, and then a guy named Tischendorf uh, discovered a manuscript he thought was the most important, and he might, he was, he was soft right about that, um, and he gave it, he thought it should be at the head of the list, so he gave it a capital Aleph, Hebrew letter Aleph, which I will show to you when it comes up. Um, but generally, majuscules are capital Bs. Papyrus, parchment. 
Now we have majuscules. We also have minuscules. Um, and these are both written on parchment, not papyrus. But majuscules are written in big letters, which is what majuscule means. And minuscules are written in <coughs> small letters. This, again, is the Gospel of John. A little bit harder to read, wouldn't you say? There's our epsilon, big glorious <laughs> epsilon. That's a new. RK, pretty easy to read. Hain, ho, that's a lamed. Logos, apa, chi, ho, logos. I think it's a lot harder to read. Um, but once you, you, know, you look at it for a while, you start to get the hang of it. Here is my uh, Aleph. This is Codex Sinaiticus, which was probably stolen from St. Catherine's Monastery by Tischendorf. It's a sordid story, um, but is one of our two most important witnesses to the text of the New Testament. Um, and here we have a minuscule page. Uh, so capital letters. Minuscules are, as a rule, written in numbers. And there are thousands of these because almost all the minuscules represent what I call the Byzantine text. There are exceptions to that rule, um, but it's this, this late text that is less useful to us. Um, uh, so we use numbers. So this is O8. So, refresher, Greek manuscripts. We have, uh, according to material they're written in papyrus, in majuscule script, um, is we call papyri, um, parchment, majuscule script, we call uncles or majuscules, call them majuscules, that's the accepted term. But parchment and minuscule script are here, and this category is empty. This categorization is neat, and it roughly corresponds to certain dates. So the papyri are generally second through sixth century, and almost all of these, up until I think the fifth century, almost all of these are recovered from Egypt, because when you want something to last for a long time, the most important thing is temperature stability. Things can last in the cold. Things can last in the heat. What you need is stability. And Egypt is relatively stable. Um, uh, the majuscules come about, and start, they start appearing in the fourth century. Um, and they continue for a while. Um, but minuscules really start taking over in the ninth century. Um, so earliest, middle-ish, later. Now, this is my favorite piece of the New Testament, kind of. This is the Dura fragment, and it is the oldest piece of the New Testament we have from anywhere other than Egypt. It is, uh, we can date it with absolute confidence because we found it in a collapsed wall um, to the mid third century, and it is written on parchment. <laughs> um, so this kind of breaks the system. It's also not completely a canonical gospel. It's a harmony of the four gospels with some interesting readings, which is sort of a, a fun little puzzle. So this messes with our system. But this is a pretty reliable system. And here we have some of our important uh, witnesses, P50, some examples. Um, and they're written as such, P52, P56, P66, P75, capital letters, numbers. Good. Now you're falling asleep, I know. So let's get another interesting textual variant up there. This is in Mark 16. Uh, Mark 16 in um, your Bibles at verse 8 has a line, and then there are several endings. You're familiar with the short ending, probably the shortest end. The shortest ending is they ran away for they were afraid. 16.9 in some Bibles has they ran away and they told Peter and everyone's happy, right? Um, and then there's the longer ending, which is... Um, has three short stories that all look like they're cribbed from the other Gospels. Um, and there's the, the revelation on the road to Damascus and things like that. Um, and sort of this, the, uh, the handling snakes episode happens in um, the longer ending. And then there's this story. This is in Codex Washingtonianus. And they excuse themselves saying, Jesus has just appeared to them at dinner. And they excuse themselves saying, this age of lawlessness and unbelief is under Satan who does not allow the truth and power of God to prevail over the unclean things of the spirits. Therefore, reveal thy righteousness now. This is the devil made me do it, uh, of the ancient world. The disciples are saying, Jesus is wondering at their disbelief, the disciples say, the devil made me do it, right? Um, 
Interestingly, Jerome knows this ending to Narnia, which is fascinating. So it's at least that old. Um, and Codec Washingtonianus is such an ugly word, but we call it that because it's in Washington, D.C. Now, I love versions. Versions is what we call any copy of the New Testament that isn't written in Greek. And there are three that are going to be important to you. There is the Latin. Uh, you guys want me to explain what Latin is, right? It's an Italian language, ancient Rome. It's the official language of that. OK. But well, Greek is, but, but yeah. You know what Latin is. There's Syriac. And this is the closest analog to the language in which Jesus himself spoke, which is interesting. He spoke in Palestinian Aramaic, um, and this is the closest cousin language to that. And so there are fascinating cases, like in the Gospel of John, where there's an Aramaic word and then the Greek glosses it. Well, when you're writing in Syriac, the, it's the same word, so they just leave off the glosses. Um, they don't need to gloss it because it's the word. Um, so Messiah, for instance, in the Gospel of John uh, is written in Aramaic and then glossed in Greek. Um, uh, this is Syriac, and this is Coptic, which looks a lot like Greek. But this is the, this is the latest form of the language of the Egyptians. Um, and they have taken the hieroglyphs, have turned into Demotic, and the Demotic has been, they've written down with Greek letters. So while these letters look like Greek, it is in fact another language. And there's a couple letter forms um, here and here. Uh, for sounds that wasn't in Greek, that is an Egyptian, that they had to capture. Now, the Latin, the, 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 these versions, these are the oldest versions, can be subdivided um, significantly. So we have the Old Latin, which looks like it's coming about in the third century. Dating these things are tricky, but Tertullian, one of our, our first, our first major Latin author of early Christianity, is probably reading a Greek New Testament still. So it looks like it's coming sometime after Tertullian. Um, so we have, and this, these are typically in your apparatus, marked with lowercase Latin letters. So lowercase b. Um, if the old Latin pretty much all agrees, you get this, which is Italian, um, Itala, uh, which is a, a shorthand for old Latin. Um, Jerome comes around and decides that all the Latin versions are a mess. I should do my own. I'll do it better because I'm Jerome. Um, and he composes the Latin Vulgate, um, and this is VG. And when all of these agree on one reading, we get Latin. Syriac, the old Syriac manuscripts are, we had two of them until 2016, when Sebastian Brock announced we had discovered a third. This is a huge deal for someone like me. I know you're excited as well. Um, these were S SY, Syriac, Synatic, and Curatonian. Um, these, again, appear in the third century. Uh, before these came about, in Syriac, these are called the Gospels of the Separated. Because the first Bible in the Syriac-speaking world, the first Gospels, were, was Tatian's Diatessaron, which we're going to talk about. Um, but these probably came about sometime after Tatian. Um, and these are our old Syriac Gospels. Uh, there's the Peshida, which is basically a revision of the old Syriac to standardize it, um, which we do at SYP. And then there is the Harclean, which is a really wooden Syriac translation of the Byzantine Greek text, um, which we do at SYH. Finally, Coptic comes in three flavors, Sahidic, Bohiric, Middle Egyptian. That date is also tricky. but. Uh, it's a good guess. And when all these agree, we just have CF. Another variant, a virginal variant. This variant exists in no Greek manuscripts of the New Testament, but it appears in both an Old Latin gospel. So, this is, uh, so Jesus has just died, and the Jews are beating their breasts and saying, woe to us. Um, I forgot a word there for what happened. Woe to us for what happened today happened on account of our sins. It shows up in Latin, and it shows up in both Old Syriac Gospels. Woe to us, what are these things, which is a, looks like a botched reading of the same, or translation of the same Greek. Woe to us for our sins. This is interesting, 
because Latin and Syriac don't interact. And so these presumably went back to a common Greek that is now completely lost. And these are one of the many ways in which versions are interesting. Is um, especially, I mean, they preserve all sorts of fascinating varied readings, but especially when you get languages, cultures that basically didn't interact, um, and they have the same reading half the world apart, um, there, we must have lost some popular reading of the Greek New Testament. Now, it's not entirely true, or there may be an exception to it, there not being any Greek, because Tatian, uh, my, my gospel author of the second century, um, seemed to have had this reading in his Bible. Uh, um, we have in the commentary written on Tatian's Gospel, uh, um, preserved here only in classical Armenian, the same story. So uh, Tatian, too, it seems, knew this reading, and Tatian was probably working in Greek. And that's a nice transition to our last class, thankfully, of witnesses. That is, patristic citations. When church fathers write, um, they often, as you know, quote the New Testament. And these can be useful, because sometimes church fathers discuss textual variants. And where they don't, they are usually quoting a text. Um, and so uh, Bart Ehrman started this series um, with his doctoral dissertation and the text of Didymus the Blind. And we now have a bunch of reconstructions of the text of the New Testament based on <coughs> patristic citations. This gives us a couple interesting things. We can date this with the sort of security that we can't date manuscripts of the New Testament, right? Um, we know when Didymus was alive, and we know where he was alive. So we can also place him this geographically. Um, so, uh, and in the case of Marcion, a figure who revised the Gospel of Luke in the mid to early second century, um, this is older than any of our copies of the New Testament. So we have here Marcion attesting a text of the New Testament that antedates any copy that survives. Now there are problems, of course, with this, because church fathers do not feel a special obligation to stick particularly closely to the text that they're copying. Uh, they like to paraphrase or amend or change things. And figuring out that they're doing this and when they're doing this is hard. Furthermore, scribes of church fathers like to correct when they think the church father has made a mistake, and that's very annoying. But um, this is another source of text, or another source, of, another source for the reconstruction of the New Testament text. Um, and these in your apparatus are listed by abbreviations of their names. These will come after all the other witnesses. These are listed last in the apparatus. Okay, so where does this leave us? This leaves us with thousands and thousands of manuscripts, Greek manuscripts in the New Testament, that agree with each other at a rate of about 95%. So they have almost the exact same text. And the two earliest manuscripts of this sort are Codex Alexandrinus, at, which is A. So there are, there are five letters, where's the marker? There are five letters I want you to remember. These will give you a kickstart. So write these down. I'm not dyslexic. I meant that already. Um, a is Codex Alexandrinus, and C is a Framie Rescriptus. It's called that because the it's a, um, it's a palimpsest. Someone has erased the New Testament and written a copy of Ephraim over the top. Um, and these are our two earliest witnesses to this kind of text. When these are marked in your apparatus, um, when all these things agree, they can't list thousands of manuscripts, so they give us a Gothic M. All the other ones. Then we have what used to be called the Alexandrian text. I'm not going to go into the history there, but these two manuscripts agree with each other a lot. Uh, this is Sinaiticus. This is the manuscript that Tischendorf probably stole from St. Catherine's Monastery. And 
B is Vaticanus, which is preserved in the Vatican. I don't know its history. I think it's, we don't really know. Um, so these texts agree a lot. Um, we need to do one more text before we, ah, and then, and then we have D, Codex Beze Calabrigiensis, and this is the manuscript that has all the fun. Uh, here we get our first witness to the longer ending of Mark. Here we get the Pericopa Adulteri, and this, has, this is where we have the extra story in the picking of grain on the Sabbath, and lots of other weird or interesting um, variant readings. Agreeing with our quote-unquote weird text, we have the Old Latin text, which is a bit interesting. And Marcion, Justin Martyr, and Tatian all, all seem to support this quote unquote weird text. And this was historically called the Western text, and that's a problem. Uh, but we call this the Western text. So if you read a New Testament in the, or a commentary and they refer to a Western reading, this is the cluster of witnesses that all agree. Two very important figures came along Westcott and Hort. Um, and they published a book called the Introduction to the Greek New Testament, where they showed that the majority, or Byzantine text, often conflates manuscript readings that are found here and here. So there'll be places where these two clusters of witnesses have different readings, and this will combine them. And it was on this basis that the King James Version and the text it was based on was finally dethroned. Up until this, up until Westcott and Hort, there had been antecedents, of course, but up until Westcott and Hort, um, the King James Version really had a scholarly following. That is, the version of the text with the longer endings of Mark, the Prick of the Adulteri, um, uh, the Trinitarian affirmation in 1 John. Um, Westcott and Hort undermined that primarily with this one argument, that um, this conflates readings from these two clusters of manuscripts. But how do we decide then between these two? There isn't a great way. Westcott and Hort argued that in the most uncontroversial cases, if you look at places where the doesn't, where you can tell based on internal criteria what the what they think the author probably wrote, or where there are nonsense readings, that this is almost always a better text than this. And so they argued when we can't tell, when we can't decide between the two, we should take the one that is generally more reliable. There are about 12 cases where they thought that was wrong. Uh, these are called the Western Non-Interpolations, which is the worst name for anything ever in New Testament studies. Um, that is, the texts that weren't inter no wait, the Western Non-Interpolations. Yeah, the texts that weren't interpolated into the West. It's a terrible name. But basically, it's places where this has readings that they think are wrong. Uh, a famous case of these is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This, isn't found. this is found here, but it's not found here. And um, there are a bunch, bunch of other of these. Jesus crying blood the night before he died. Also, these scholars argued that that probably isn't original to the New Testament, but um, is found in these two. Jesus being stabbed to death on the cross, another case. Found in these two, absent from all of these. <coughs> Time went on. And we, there, a discovery was made. Oh wait, first we got to do, uh, first thing that happened, because I'm, old Syri I'm a Syriac junkie, um, we discovered the old Syriac, and this is why the term Western is really a problem, because the old Syriac also agrees with these readings. Um, and the old Syriac is far, far east. We discovered the papyri. Uh, the Oxyrhynchus excavations um, and others uh, the papyri are now our oldest sources for the New Testament, and these, as a rule, agreed with Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. And this is as this was taken to be a confirmation of Westcott and Hort's arguments. We've discovered a bunch of new papyri, and these almost all agree with the manuscripts we already thought were really reliable. Yes. How sharp are the disagreements between? That's a hard question to answer. Um, they give different readings. We're going to look at a couple in a second. Um, so maybe we'll hold off on answering that. Um, 
in terms of, I don't have a statistic for like percentage of variant readings they disagree on. Um, uh, let's look at some variants and maybe we'll come back. You'll see the sort of things we're talking about. Um, now things have gotten considerably more complicated since then. Uh, these dots don't actually correspond to particular manuscripts I have in mind. Um, but we discovered Western readings in the papyri. Um, in fact, we even have perhaps one Byzantine papyri, which is really problematic, um, virus. Um, and we've discovered things are considerably more complicated. Um, and you'll have to do your own reading to catch up on all of that. But that's how we got to basically the text in your NA28. Um, the NA28 looks a whole lot like what Westcott and Hort printed before we discovered our papyri before we discovered most of our old Syriac witnesses, before we made all of our recent discoveries, um, Westcott Hort had pretty much established the text that's printed in the year 28. Manuscripts are weighed, not counted. This is, the, this is perhaps the biggest problem with trotting out the 5,000 manuscript argument for the textual reliability of the New Testament. Because we have a huge remove between when the New Testament, well, we have more than 100 years before when the New Testament was composed and our first manuscripts show up. And in our earliest witnesses, we have these stark disagreements. So you can't simply count manuscripts because if you did, you'd end up with this text. Um, and it's not all about manuscripts. So let's look at some variants. Um, I'm not sure, those must be my sigla. Um, so this is Mark 141, a famous reading to illustrate the difference between the, the, the so-called Western and the so-called Alexandrian text types. And Jesus, and being moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be made clean. Does anyone know what the variant here is? Mm -hmm. Ah, good. So this is your NA28. You can flip to it yourself. I've just cropped the bits. Here's the word uh, for compassion, splogging the face. And if we look down in our apparatus, 141, we have an earlier variant marked by this sigma here. Um, someone has written Jesus instead of Kai. Let's skip that for the moment and move all the way down. Well, let me get a, um, a broken bracket. And here is the support for what's actually printed, the text, so the Kai. And we skip down to our reading. Or guess this. What does this mean? No? I heard it. Angry. Angry. Being made angry. Mark 141, does it say Jesus was moved with compassion or Jesus was made angry? Here is uh, the reading in Codex Beze itself, Kai or Gis face, being made angry. Now you remember, D, generally not terribly reliable, right? This is the one that has all the weird readings. but. What is more likely, that a scribe came along and found a compassionate Jesus and decided, oh, this isn't, this isn't any good, Jesus wasn't compassionate, erased this and changed this to an angry Jesus? Does that seem particularly likely? Because this is not the sort of change that happens accidentally, right? Splugmithes and Orgisthes, this isn't a slip of the pen. Someone has changed the reading one way or another. We also have a bunch of old Latin manuscripts that agree with uh, Codex Beze, and as of two weeks ago, I found out, we have a brand new old Syriac manuscript, what I referred to as the New Finds, that also has anger. We didn't have any support for this previously, um, except Tatian. Tatian also seems to have this reading, which is interesting. Uh, so we have here the sort of um, Latin and Syriac agreeing together uh, with a problematic Greek support. Um, and NA28 still prints uh, compassion, but a lot of contemporary translations. I believe the new F the NIV now prints anger, um, because if we're going to ask what is it more likely that a scribe would do, it seems a lot more likely that a scribe is going to come across Jesus getting angry before the, he heals someone, and think there's a problem here. They must have meant compassion, right? As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, does anyone know what the problem with this text is in Mark 1-2? Does anyone know this variant? Here it is. Here's the full context. As it is written, behold, I send to you an angel uh, before my face um, to, who, is preparing my, who is preparing your way. 
Well, it's because the text that follows isn't Isaiah. Well, kinda. It's Malachi first, and then it's Isaiah. What do we have in the apparatus? Well, someone has changed this to the prophets. Again, not a mistake. Someone has fixed the text here. Uh, just to familiarize you with these readings. Um, so we have our, our broken text here. So in support of this text, OK, we have, is this a negative apparatus? Yeah, well, so we have Codex Alexandrinus, um, the first the earliest Byzantine witness, a bunch of other Byzantine witnesses. Um, this says all the rest. Some manuscripts of Jerome's Vulgate, the Syriac Hexapla, and some manuscripts of the Coptic version, the Bohiric, um, and then the Latin text of Irenaeus. Irenaeus survives not entirely in Greek, part of it only survives in Latin. Another fun one. Let's flip to this one, Mark 2, 26. Really picking on Mark today. <laughs> He entered the house of God when Abiathar, talking about David here, was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Does anybody know what the problem is here? That Abiathar wasn't high priest. Abiathar was not high priest when David came to the temple. If you read 1 Samuel, it was Ahimelech. So if we look at our. Did I put it up here? If we look at our manuscripts, you will find that this has been corrected. It's been omitted entirely by Codex Beze, the D, Codex Washingtonianus, the entire old, old Italian, Old Latin, and the Syriac, the Old Syriac. Manuscripts have come along, or scribes have come along and fixed the text for us. And finally, we have just another signal to familiarize yourself. These double brackets. These double brackets indicate that there is a text there which the editors of this critical edition agree probably wasn't original, but is so traditional and important that they decided to print it anyways. That is, and Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Printed in brackets in your critical edition. Um, and we go to look at this. Um, we go to look at the support. Um, this box means omit. Uh, to find out what these sigla mean, you're going to want to open your brown text. And it's on the back, critical signs in the text. Um, so omitting this is P75, one of our oldest papyri, um, the second hand of Codex Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and Codex Beze. So we have witnesses from both the green school and the red school, right? Both the Alexandrian and the Western text, all omitting this passage. Um, and yet, it still gets printed in lots of English New Testaments, but usually with a note saying some ancient authorities omit this. That is all I've prepared for today. Um, we have time for questions, five minutes. Uh, happy to field some.